Good morning, or should I say perhaps good afternoon now to, to all of you, as I've finally been able to make my way here to my alma mater uh, to receive your very kind invitation, truly an honorarium. My delight to be able to appear here with you and to reflect upon the history of my alma mater, alma mater for many of us here, our nation's alma mater. Is it not truly the most remarkable, unrecorded moment in our nation's history that we are all together? All together upon principles of revolutionary thinking, for I, I have come to recognize that that continues, perhaps the best exemplified in, in the improvement of the old Royal College of the former Majesties, King William and Queen Mary, the College simply of William and Mary, attendant now with this, this school, devoted to revolutionary thinking. You know, as I reflect upon revolutionary thinking, I cannot but help but reflect upon what I consider, what many Virginians have considered, was the very first American Revolution. That, that which was engaged here in the old colony of Virginia, perhaps some of you know that I am still the, the keeper of the rolls of the history of the minutes of the old Virginia House of Burgesses, the early minutes of the Virginia House of Delegates. I, I brought them unto my mansion house, Monticello, at the time of the invasion, the invasions of General Arnold and later of General Lord Cornwallis. And there I enjoy to reflect upon these minutes and these histories. And I discovered something most interesting. This was written by one of the early royal governors of Virginia, 100 years before our revolution began. It was written to the King of England which was his duty. Your Majesty, I thank God there are no free schools nor printing presses in Virginia, and I hope we shall not have these a hundred years, for learning has brought disobedience and heresy into the world, and printing has divulged them, and libels as well, against the best governments. God keep us from both. Perhaps this is evidence of what prevented another charter to be achieved for establishing a universal curriculum here in the old colony of Virginia. As you know, the very first collegiate curriculum was established by the old Virginia House of Burgesses in 16 and 19, a college at Henricus. It only lasted about three years before it was destroyed in the Indian uprising of 22. And as you can see, Several decades later, there was no intention to install another collegiate curriculum until after that revolution, that, that rebellion led by Nathaniel Bacon in opposition to Governor William Barclay, whose jottings I have just now shared with you, until that revolution became the more successful to provide a greater enlightenment amongst those settled in this old colony, it then became the more evident that Free thought provides the greater advance of any people. The greater dissemination of ideas, facts, and truths will help a people to improve their condition than anything else. And perhaps some of you know I'm rather honored in my lineage to know that my great-grandfather, my mother's grandfather, William Randolph, in collaboration with the Reverend Dr. James Blair, succeeded in the early 1690s to achieve and acquire a charter from the Majesty's King William and Queen Mary to establish this college here in Virginia. To establish it upon the premise of a, of a grammar school, yes, a school of divinity, later on a school of mathematics and natural philosophy. And perhaps some of you know that I was enrolled in that school of mathematics and natural philosophy. And what a great opportunity it was. I have reflected upon it often and even confided my thoughts and correspondence. It was my great and good fortune to fall under the tutelage of one Dr. William Small. He held the chair of mathematics and natural philosophy. And of him, I have provided a tripartite description of his character. I said, firstly, he had gentlemanly and correct manners. How important that is for a civilized society the art of showing respect to one another. Secondly, I said he had an enlarged and liberal mind. It is not a political statement. It is a testament, rather, to his success in the Socratic method of education, provoking the intellect with questions and in the answers to continue that provocation to a greater 
happiness, let alone a greater enlightenment. And finally, Dr. Small had a happy talent for communication. He made learning an enjoyable adventure, inspirational, provoking the imagination accordingly. You know, I have summed up my experience with Dr. Small by saying simply, perhaps more than any other in my life, he fixed my destinies. Right here at William and Mary. A comment, if you will, recognizing the value of a good teacher, the value of a good education. Now that will follow an individual throughout their lives, helping them to capitalize on their own ideas, helping them, as the French would say, become an entrepreneur. Truly, to, to help them to know how to organize and administer their capitalizing on their ideas. That's been many years ago now. As I rode down the Duke of Gloucester Street, noticing much looks the same, venturing over to the old college building that we believe to have been designed by Sir Christopher Wren. Yes, that looks the same, and yet look, marvels. Marvels indeed that now are about us. And I could not help reflect, but certain habits and customs have, have changed accordingly. Imagine <laughs> the President of the United States has entered this chamber and you all remain seated. <laughs> but in my estimation, that is how it should be, citizens, for after all, who holds the reins of our government? You do. The citizenry do. That is the remarkable achievement that we have made as a people which began right here in this city, Williamsburg City, the 15th day of May, 1776. Never let us forget it. When Virginia was the first of all of the colonies to proclaim itself free and independent and thereby to, to allow that resolution to be brought to Philadelphia City where the Continental Congress was there and seated and to provoke them to vote on the resolution of Virginia for independency. Oh, habits and customs have changed, though we continue to remain a most extraordinary revolutionary people, following the principles of revolution through free thought. You know, as I dismounted out of doors, I took off my riding boots and put on my shoes, and I thought, well, I might be observed by you all as curiously appareled. I even conjured up an apology until I walked in to greet you, and I thought, well, no, I'm not so curiously appareled as I observed every other. <laughs> And yet the fashions I know have changed, quite different from what I knew as a young boy attending to this college. The fashion of the gentlemen here in the old colony of Virginia in our capital city of Williamsburg, old gentlemen wore long frock coats buttoning down to their knees. You rarely see those any longer. Gentlemen have cut away their frocks, cut away the points of their waistcoats. You no longer see the tri-corner hat. They're never, well, they're not fashionable any, anymore. Now, it, with the exception of this city, where they are continually worn as an honorarium, but no, gentlemen are, are sporting these top hats growing ever the higher. And you may wonder now, have I lost my mind to ramble on upon fashion and style? And that's precisely my point. I have some of you have read, as I have written, in matters of style, simply swim with the current. But in matters of principle, stand like a rock. And so we have in maintaining those principles over which we fought our American Revolution. Principles of enlightenment, principles of free thought, principles inherent in the individual to improve their condition, to progress forward in that improvement. Principles that have been argued and debated from time immemorial as to whether man is capable of governing himself and here, in our nation, concurrent with our Declaration of American Independence, to be able to read for those who had the opportunity of an education, to read a most extraordinary work, which was published that same year. I'm speaking of the work of the, the Scottish political economist, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, purporting then the inherent right of capital, capital to be engaged by an individual, that they can capitalize upon their opinions, their ideas, invest accordingly, engage their business accordingly. Do you know that I have used that word capitalize several times, whereas Adam Smith hardly mentions it? For to capitalize 
is a purely American recognition. We have come up with that word. That is ours solely. A nation founded upon the inherent right of an individual to improve their life. You know, this word entrepreneur I find phantasmagorical. I have never heard of it before, but it is French and that delights me. The recognition of an individual to organize and administer administer indeed their business to organize and to initiate to initiate enterprise just as valid is it not the French word with the English word and thereby associated with the American word to capitalize this is what we have achieved remarkable indeed and I am so proud and honored to return here and to see that the principles over which we engaged our American Revolution are further in what is achieved here, here at this school, here in this new curriculum, which cannot help but begin to disseminate itself widely and continue to provide Williamsburg, as I have always called it, not only a capital of good manners, not only a capital of good morals, not only a capital of hospitality, but most importantly, a capital of education, to which many will continue to seek zealously their improvement. <laughs> you know, as I rode here, I could not help but think it still takes me the same amount of time on horseback to make any distance as it did when I was a young man, riding eastwards here from Albemarle County to attend the old Royal College. That was a distance of 120 miles. Do you know it still, still takes me five days in the saddle to cover 120 miles? Those who own a horse would well understand you never ride over any great distance but about 35 or 40 miles a day so as not to tear out your horse, let alone yourselves. You never travel any faster over a long distance than five miles an hour in the saddle. And, and think, <laughs> it's the privilege of an individual who owns a fine riding horse, the great majority who do not continue to walk comfortably three miles an hour. The calculation then of the average rate of speed upon the globe as I know it shows it to remain a four mile an hour world, is it not? That is the world that I have always known and yet extraordinary advances are being made every day. This most marvelous steam and powered engine now placed in a boat to travel against the current. Mr. Leeper in Philadelphia engaging a steam and powered engine in a cart placed on two rails parallel to propel itself forward. What will we see tomorrow? What is next. This is the kind of curriculum, curriculum that helps us to get there, that helps us to organize, that helps to provoke the intellect as to what may be next and how we may begin individually to initiate the pursuit in order to harness it, not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of the family man across the globe. Now, these are the principles we have a bear in mind, and that is why we remain a revolutionary people. Do you know it was Montesquieu who once wrote, a revolution is a good thing every generation or so. I have capitalized on his opinion. I myself have drafted that, ex written it extensively. I mean not so much a rebellion, a revolt, a bloodshed. No, no, that oft times can be the result of revolutionary thought, but no, revolution is in its essence simply the revolving back to the essential elements, the principles, the facts, the truths of freedom and liberty. I can assure you that has ever been our guide from the very beginning here in Virginia and now across the globe. Oh, I enjoy our history. You've heard me cite that here this day. But I share with you, I share with you my love and dreams of the future which I dare say I enjoy better than the history of our past.